Thank you all so much. It's really an honor to be here. Um, it's great to hear our other, one of our other candidates, and there are many candidates. There are about five of us, I think, for the Green Party, and I think it's a sign of health that uh, the party has many candidates representing uh, diverse points of view, although I've got to say we, uh, we all kind of have a very similar platform, um, and I think it's, it, it's a great thing for the Green Party, so thanks. Thanks for having a program that can accommodate us. And you know, thanks to the Orange County Greens for having this wonderful, timely uh, program and hosting Chris Hedges, uh, who I think has expressed so well you know, this moment that we're in, this incredible existential moment of a moral imperative. And I will say, you know, it makes me remember Rosa Clemente's uh, wonderful point that uh, the Green Party is also an imperative. It's no longer the, the alternative, it is now the imperative. In the same way that, you know, that we have a, uh, we're in an existential moment. And we are calling all rebels, you know, and, and we are rebels. The rebellion, I think, is in full swing. And part of that rebellion must also be electoral. Because if we only fight out uh, in the communities, if we're only fighting in the street, and we're not also fighting in the halls of power, then everything we accomplish will basically be steamrolled and for naught. So this is why I think it's so important that as a party we're doing what we're doing. So again, I applaud all of you who are part of the Green Party or those of you who are here to check it out. Um, and those of you who are leaning, I really encourage people to use your voter registration as, uh, as an existential act, as a political act, as an act of rebellion, and take that rebellion into the voting booth. <laughs> so I want to say a little bit about you know, this amazing moment that we're in, because uh, it's sort of you know, it's both a, an historic crisis as well as an historic opportunity. And we see all around us this uprising for democracy and justice that is really sweeping the nation and the planet. The strike, the hunger strike at Diet High School in Chicago for 32 days. Really amazing. They got a partial uh, win out of that, but the fight is not over yet. Um, the students who are fighting for free public higher education and the Corinthian students who are boycotting their debt, their college debt, uh, that's a struggle. The Black Lives Matter, incredibly inspiring struggle. The Dreamers, uh, I don't know if you can remember back to 15 or 20 years ago, but we weren't seeing this kind of thing at all. And, and now this is, you know, this is the, the sign of the times, these acts of incredibly courageous rebellion. And this is the exciting thing. And people are calling for not only their own issue, but for a broader vision of democracy and justice, and for a world and a nation that works for all of us. And I think this is one of the biggest differences that we see now as organizers and activists, is that we're refusing to be separated into our individual uh, struggles, and that we are unifying for a broader movement for people, planet, and peace over profit. And again, the Green Party provides an electoral framework. We used to look to political parties to bring us together, to reach critical mass, to have a unifying vision. We don't have that from, you know, Democrats and Republicans. Um, they've just been sold out and bought out. So we're not seeing a unifying vision there. And again, I think it falls to the Green Party to put this together for people. At the same time, we're seeing this big vision you know, we're also seeing this big crisis. And indeed, it's the crisis that's really engaging people now and telling us that we must act, you know, we must engage and we must come together and not be divided and conquered, which is how they want us to be. 
Um, you know, and if you look at this crisis, it's really across the board and it's global and there's really no issue out there right now that isn't uh, extremely precarious. If you look at the economy, they tell us we're in a recovery, but in fact, it's an emergency, would you say? Yeah, right. And we're here to tell it like it is and also how we can fix it. Because if we don't acknowledge what we're up against, you know, we can't begin to move the solutions. While the unemployment rate has come down, you know, to some 5% approximately now, you know, why has it come down? In part because people are dropping out of the labor market. So you're not counted, you know, if you're not actively seeking work in the last four weeks, you don't get counted. So that's part of what brings the numbers down. Uh, the numbers are also coming down because what kind of jobs are they creating now? You know, they're creating part-time and temporary jobs that pay lousy wages and come with no benefits. Anybody know about those jobs? Yeah, yeah. And, and if you talk to people who are coming out of high school who can't afford to go to college or people who are, have gone through college and they got debt, you know, that's all they see are these low-wage jobs, if any. So, you know, we have an economic crisis. Part of that crisis is that we have 40 million young people, an entire generation of young people who are locked into debt, locked into predatory debt, which you cannot escape even through bankruptcy. Uh, predatory debt that will follow you around into your retirement, to your old age, you know, and it will harvest your Social Security. Um, in debt for life, really a generation of debt at much higher interest rates, you know, than you would pay on a mortgage. It's absolutely unbelievable that a generation is being used as a cash cow for predatory banks and that our government is right in the middle of it. <laughs> if you look at health care, health care that was supposed to have been fixed by Obamacare, well, I come from the state of Romney care. Same thing, actually. We just had it for about five years before it became Obamacare. You know, they passed it sight unseen. It was written in the back rooms in Massachusetts, you know, on which the national bill was modeled. Written in the back rooms. Nobody could read it. Not even the legislators could read it. It was written by the lobbyists, by the pharmaceutical and insurance companies. And indeed, that's who it serves. And what we found in Massachusetts after a few years was is that people feel really good having their piece of paper, but the problem is if you get sick, you discover that there are holes in this plan big enough to drive a hearse through. And in fact, people are less cared for under obama romney care than they are uh, uh, prior to that because now we don't have the safety net institutions and the safety net hospitals and many of the community health centers and things like that that we used to have. Medical bankruptcy has not been reduced one iota. You know, so this is basically a boondoggle for insurance companies um, and was used really to stave off the real solution, Medicare for all, which we must have. <laughs> and which will save us. It doesn't cost us, it saves us. We can cover everybody and we still save $400 billion a year by cutting out the waste and the uh, incredible massive red tape and bureaucracy of the private health insurance industry. So just by streamlining it, by, like Medicare, the overhead goes way down and we save a whole lot of money and we get healthy and when you get sick you can focus on getting better not on trying to figure out how you're supposed to pay for the thing so it's it's inexcusable that we don't have this right now if you look at the climate you know um, it's an emergency almost too big to get your hands around I drove down here from LA uh, it was 102 degrees in the car um, and, you know, it's, it's hot out there, and our air conditioner wasn't working in the car, you know, and, and this, is, this is the future. This is what it looks like. Um, we know that California has about a year of water left. We know that the um, ground is actually sinking because 
uh, the underground water, the, re the underground reservoirs are being drawn on as farmers dig their wells deeper. Um, you know, there were heat waves in Iran last week where the recorded uh, temperature index, heat, heat humidity index, which is basically what the temperature feels like, it felt like 165 degrees, you know. We thought it was hot here today. 165 is the effective temperature that we're getting now. Um, and maybe the most alarming news of all was hearing about two weeks ago the new study put out by Jim Hansen, the uh, major climate scientist of North America, uh, whose latest study says that sea level rise, you know, that we always thought was going to be maybe a thousand years away, and then maybe it was going to be a couple hundred years away. Well, now it's just a couple decades away that they are predicting at least 10 feet of sea level rise as some of the major ice sheets in the Antarctica and Greenland begin to break up on our current trajectory. And that's the really important take home. That's on our current trajectory. Uh, we are kind of on a doomsday uh, scenario at the moment. But the take home here is that we can fix this. We don't have to have that. When people talk about the climate gloom and doom, they presume that we have a paralyzed political system. They talk about what's politically possible. Well, we need to start talking about what is necessary for humanity and kick out the politicians who don't act on those terms. If they think it's, in, it, it's politically impossible, it's time to show them the door. Um, you know, likewise, in terms of the racial justice crisis, you know, I think we've seen the magnificent uh, work done by Black Lives Matter, and they have done so much to raise consciousness. This is not a new crisis, as we know. This is basically a living legacy of the criminal institution of slavery, of, of, of Jim Crow, of um, redlining, of segregation. Uh, of the drug wars in the prison state. This is nothing new. So we, in our campaign, we have adopted the plan of the Malcolm X grassroots movement, um, and they have a wonderful plan uh, called a National Action Plan for Racial Justice Now. There's no reason not to solve this problem now. And, and I want to just make the point that these are not separate problems. These are all integrated with each other. In the same way that the problems converge, the solutions converge. And we can, um, you know, in my view, we need to declare an emergency. We have a state of emergency, an economic emergency, a racial justice emergency, and a climate emergency. How about we fix them right now? Yeah.